There are too many books in 5th edition D&D 11 big campaigns, 7 setting books, 4 box starter sets 3 adventure anthologies, 3 bestiaries, 3 player companions, and 1 dungeon master's guide and there's like three new books coming out just this year. So it's time to actually talk about which ones are worth their space on your shelf. Hey, I'm Bob. This is where we learn how to have more fun playing D&D together. And I already made a video about how all these big books often get in the way of our fun. But they don't always get in the way of our fun. Let me cut to the chase and say my favorite D&D books are the player companions, loaded with character options and new ideas, including our inspiring sponsor, Valda's Spire of Secrets. 10 new classes, 150 plus subclasses, 130 spells, tons of weapons, magic items, feats, and optional rules to truly expand your 5e experience for any adventure or setting. It's like dunking Xanathar's Guide into Tasha's Cauldron and conjuring the player's handbook too that you've been dreaming of. Check out Valda's Spire of Secrets through the link below. So here are all of the official 5e books and boxes that Grace and I have hoarded over the years. I think it's about half of all of the books currently published for D&D 5e. And if it were just up to me, this stack would be much shorter. I'm kind of a minimalist. I don't like to have a lot of stuff, certainly a lot of stuff that I don't use, but relationships are about compromise. So we're keeping everything, but I'm going to tell you how we decided which books to purchase and which ones I would actually buy again if I were to restart our collection to help you decide which ones can add value to your game. And to make this task a little bit easier, I'll be breaking down these books into categories from the silly intro, and there's a link below to my Amazon store where you can pick up any D&D 5e books and support the channel. Man, this is too much. All right, so we're gonna start way up here with the big campaigns and the first one that I ever played, Princes of the Apocalypse. We played this for close to a year, if not over, with a couple friends, and it was fun, but from a wide perspective of DMs who have reviewed all of these books, Princes of the Apocalypse is widely considered to be one of, if not the worst, the worst hardcover campaigns put out by Wizards of the Coast. It's focused on this clashing of elemental forces, specifically these princes of elemental evil. There's one here, don't remember his name. I think the main problem for this was, at least for our characters, lack of motivation to actually do the quest. My character, specifically, I created his backstory around this delegation that you're seeking in the first few levels of the game, but eventually they just kind of phase out and you're never supposed to find them. And so unless you are really into this theme of elemental forces working against each other, trying to, well, they're sort of working together against people in general, everyone on the surface, because they're all in this one giant dungeon, even though there's these different cohorts of stuff. Unless you're super into that, don't get this book. And let's put that over here. The second big adventure book that Grace and I bought, or really, I think she got this as a gift, was Out of the Abyss. Just check out that awesome cover. That is Demogorgon right on the cover. So anybody who came to D&D from Stranger Things probably wanted this. And then you find out that the whole time you're just wandering through a bunch of caves and visiting a bunch of cities where nobody likes you. Seriously, this takes one of the coolest environments of D&D, something that every campaign should dip into at some point or another. The Underdog. But you're just there the whole time. The entire campaign is cave after cave, tunnel after tunnel. Oh, and actually, the opening of this is infamous because you start out with around 6 to 12. Like, it's a high number of NPCs that the DM kind of has to know. And then it does this thing where there's a sort of opening scene in the first city that you get to, where Demogorgon is just thrashing through this Kuatoa city. And if you try to interact with that at all, you're gonna die. I always forget this, but I played a character in the first session that didn't make it out of the first session. Uh, so I often just focus on my gnome character, but I was playing a bugbear for like two hours. And so the theme with a lot of these big campaign books is that unless you are super invested in the theme that it focuses on, the single theme of the book, which in this case is the underdog, unless you really love that, don't get it. And Tomb of Annihilation. This is one of several of these adventures that just sits on the shelf 
hasn't been run, hasn't been played. I've read through this entire one because I really like this theme. So I am super into forests and ecology in the real world. It has some cool mechanics for a hex crawl, which I don't think takes a big part in any of the other adventures of 5e. And of course, it takes a lot of inspiration from the classic module, the Tomb of Horrors. But you can also get a 5e conversion of that in another 5e book that we'll talk about in a minute. So again, unless you are super in to this jungle, tropical forest theme, you probably don't want to get this book, but I will keep this in my keep pile because I like it a lot. And our next one, Waterdeep Dragon Heist, takes us out of the jungle, out of the wilderness, and even out of a lot of dungeons, and into the city. What's really cool about this book is that there are actually four ways to run it. Basically, there are different villains if you play it in the summer, the winter, the spring, or the fall. Ooh, that's a nice big art piece we just opened up to here. But Unlike the others that all take you from level 1 to 11 or 1 to 13, this one takes you from level 1 to 5. So really what you get is this one adventure rewritten four ways that's only half the length of the typical campaign contained in these same priced books. Of course, you can probably get it a lot cheaper online, but I always recommend supporting your game store when you can, and this just isn't one that you should get from them. And wow, you know I'm being super critical when now I get to by far the most popular 5e module uh, that's come out with this edition, really, Curse of Strahd. And I'm not the biggest fan. So this book, as far as I know, was like Chris Perkins' baby because he loved Ravenloft stuff from the older editions. And so he made this awesome book and people freaking love it. Vampires are awesome villains in a lot of different folklore from around the world. So it touches on this stuff that you probably expect to find in 5e. Ooh, another cool art piece there. But it still does this thing where your party is kind of stuck traveling through the Shadowfell and specifically this one demi-plane within the Shadowfell that is run by Strahd von Zarevich. And so ultimately I still find it a little too samey. Now I'll add here that friend of the channel, Mike Shea of Sly Flourish, literally runs this book, I don't know how he does this, as a one-shot every Halloween and his group loves it. But just for me and my shelf, I don't love the spooky Halloween vampire theme enough for this to really be worth the $50. Next we have Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus. This is kind of a little secret, I feel like not a lot of people talk about this, but I heard in an interview either on the Dungeons and Dragons channel or D&D Beyond with Adam Lee, the lead writer of this book, that he was writing an adventure in the hells. That was the major theme for this book. And they kind of made him slap Baldur's Gate onto it just to line up with the video game stuff. Grace has read this thoroughly. She seems to be into it, but she really loves the hells. So as much as I think the desert kind of Mad Max theme, wow, like look at that, of this book, uh, makes it probably worthwhile if you're into that. I just feel like it would be too much for me as a DM to play a year-long campaign or more in this same environment. So what we're kind of arriving at here is I personally don't find most of these adventure books to be worth the price tag. But here we go. The recent namesake of my channel, <laughs> Icewind Dale Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. I'm not even going to open this one up. I have a whole series of videos on this book. You know I love it, but I'm still kind of hitting this point where every town is so destitute. The wilderness is the same in all the different wilderness areas, and even the dungeons all, for the most part, have these effects of extreme cold. Overall, this one does a great job, though, of being a setting book for that type of environment. There's tons of locations, tons of stuff, really just too much to use in one playthrough of this book. So if you really want to play something different, because Arctic environments are hardly touched even throughout other editions of D&D, this book is for you. But for me, I'd rather stick with something like Tomb of Annihilation because I love forests and I love a good deadly dungeon. Before we get to our anthologies, let's talk about a few adventures that I don't have. Horde of the Dragon Queen, Rise of Tiamat. I've heard both of those are pretty bad. However, much like another one, not in my own stack, Storm King's Thunder, I believe they involve a lot of overland play on the Sword Coast. Hills, forests, mountains, fields. That is, I think, the kind of adventure that I love the most because it involves all these little micro environments that you can move between. There's dungeons, there's towns too. It's just diverse. And I think that is really important for my style of play. So even though I want it to be, I'm really not excited for this new Feywild book because of that carnival direction that they took it in. But now let's talk about some adventure books that I like. Candlekeep Mysteries, guys. 
This kind of came out of nowhere and I like it a lot more than I expected to. It has 17 different mystery adventures. They're not that mysterious or that much more mysterious than any other D&D adventure. I guess the difference is that you don't just know who the bad guy is right off the bat. But what I really like is that it is just 17 adventures. They're written to be played as one shots. I don't think you could actually pull that off for all of them, but there are diverse environments. There's diverse monsters that you're going to fight. It's just, that's what I found that I need in adventures. I need to be able to plug and play into a campaign or just find stuff that really stands out to me because it is different. And if I'm trying to play through the same adventure book that follows the same theme for a year, I get bored. That's just me. So Candlekeep Mysteries is totally welcome on my shelf. Definitely worth the $50 price tag. You get 17 adventures, that's like not that much money for each adventure. All right, and there are two other anthologies that we just don't have. Tales from the Yawning Portal, which contains 5e conversions of some classic adventures like Tomb of Horrors, Sunless Citadel, White Plume Mountain. Now that I am building up some interest in these older editions, maybe that's something to look forward to. And the other one, Ghost of Saltmarsh, which is supposed to be heavily themed as this nautical seafaring campaign, actually seems like it might be worth a buy. I've played through a bunch of that, at least like four levels or so. I was having fun with it, but that campaign just kind of fizzled out. But yes, it isn't really one consistent campaign. It's really three adventures from, I think, 2E that have been converted to 5E from the Greyhawk setting and now put sort of in the Forgotten Realms. But now it's time for my actual favorite adventures, <laughs> the box sets. So as a lot of you know, because it's what brought you to my channel a long time ago, this essentials kit was kind of my starting set for 5e. And as someone who was kind of deep into rule books at the time, this just seemed like a D&D light version that I could really have fun with. And that's exactly what it is. I have come to really like box sets because they contain everything you need. There's a rule book in here. The rule book has monsters. It teaches you all about character creation in this one specifically. It comes with dice, a DM screen, cards, and this awesome adventure, the Dragon of Icepire Peak. It's the only one still built to be played by only two people, one DM, one player, or with a small party, totally fine. And each of these locations are totally plug and play, similar to Candlekeep Mysteries. So I really like the Essentials Kit, and I think it's just a great value because it's like half the price of any of these other big books. Definitely in my keep pile. And the starter set with the famous, pretty much classic at this point, Lost Mine of Fandelver, is totally the same in my book. It's just famous for having these goblin ambush and dungeon delving and forest seeking elements that D&D kind of needs. A little bit fewer materials, but still the actual essentials are in this box. So whether you're starting out, whether you've been into D&D 5e for a while, I really can't get over these box sets. Definitely a buy. However, there are two other box sets that I have zero interest in whatsoever. One is themed totally around Stranger Things. It's supposed to be an adventure written by one of the characters. And I don't know, I just don't really need that kind of crossover. Same goes for the Rick and Morty one. It's a funny show, but I don't need to play Rick and Morty D&D. If I want to play any crossover, I would love Lord of the Rings to be brought into 5e, but we'll see if that ever happens again, because it happened before and then those kind of got taken off the face of the earth. And speaking of crossovers, now we can get into our setting books. Here is the Mythic Odysseys of Theros. This is a Magic the Gathering setting uh, inspired by Greek mythology that has been ported into 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons because they share the same parent company, which are the Coast. Uh, this was totally a gray spy because she loves Greek mythology and I know she's already taken some inspiration from this book. Personally, I do think it's like the coolest cover out of any D&D 5e book. But as you can see by this being the only setting book in our stack, we're not really too into setting books. So for me, this is a do not buy. And now let's talk about these other ones. Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, Strixhaven, these are both other Magic the Gathering things that I'm just not too interested in whatsoever. If you're one of the many, many, many people who love Curse of Strahd, you probably want Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. It really just expands upon the Shadowfell and Barovia and all that spooky stuff that you probably love. There's also Acquisitions Incorporated, which the red flag here is that D&D is like my main obsession. 
and I know almost nothing about that book. And then there's the newer one, Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, which is a setting from Critical Role, so all created by Matt Mercer. I actually am a pretty big fan of Critical Role, but I just have no interest to really play in their world. Still, I think what that book does really, really well is it includes an adventure. I love that in a setting book because it's like, here's your playground, now here you can play in it. I think ultimately that's kind of the direction these five ebooks are gonna have to go for me to remain interested in them. Now, perhaps one of the other more contentious picks on our stack, the Monster Manual. This is how you learn how monsters work. It really has hundreds of different monsters of all different kinds, organized quite well. You're gonna learn about all kinds of different features that these monsters can have and inspire you to create your own. So new DMs, totally worth the $50 from your friendly local game store. Long time experienced DMs, think about it some more. We got other bestiaries you might be more interested in. Like for example, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, this contains a bunch of high-level bad guys, uh, and specifically a lot of extra planar creatures and cool lore about the planes of D&D. So if you're into that, totally get this book. But if you're like me and just like material plane, low fantasy, gritty D&D, I would not get this again. Don't buy. Our third and final bestiary currently in D&D 5e, because we do actually have a new one coming out in like two months all about dragons. It's a little slimmer than our monster manual, but it contains an awesome variety of monsters, of course, as well as lore on a lot of classic monsters like beholders, giants, goblins, hags, kobolds, orcs. So stuff that are going to be incorporated into your games. Oh, and of course, it contains all these monstrous races. Uh, the orc Tabaxi, Fearbolg is in this, Kenku, Lizardfolk, Triton, Asimar. A lot of races your characters or your players will probably want to use in game. I really like Volo's Guide to Monsters. Wow, our stack has really shrunk <laughs> all the way down to one of our core books, the Player's Handbook. Of course, you can get the rule books and some basic monsters in these box sets, which again, are gonna have everything you really need to play. Then there's also the basic rules, which are free online from D&D Beyond and from Wizard of the Coast. You can download this giant PDF. It's over 180 pages. So why I think you still should buy the Player's Handbook is because to me, this is the core book of D&D 5e. It has everything you could really need to know to play. It's got great art, and it was really like the first hardcover fifth edition book to come out from Wizards of the Coast. So to me, it's kind of just a piece of nostalgia for this current edition that we are still in. I really think the Player's Handbook is just a solid buy. And now jumping over to my other two favorite player companion books. We have Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. These books together must have at least like a hundred extra subclasses. There are new spells, there are new rules, like Tasha's Cauldron has a section all about puzzles that you can drag and drop right into your game. Tons of neat adventuring environments. So in a way, kind of summing up a lot of those themes from our adventures, but just in such a concise, awesome way to really make it worthwhile. Xanathar's Guide to Everything has sections really with like supplemental rules, kind of making it like the player's handbook 1.5 and rules that you'll want to know, like details about how sleep works and what you can do with the tool sets that every character gets but then doesn't know how to actually use. Oh man, tons of random tables for encounters in all different kinds of environments. And I'm pretty sure this one even has just giant tables of, of names. Yes, making this easily one of the most useful features any DM can have because coming up with names on the spot is like the hardest part of being a DM. So I know our keep pile is Getting kind of tall, but I really think these two books are worth their money and worth the space on your shelf. The Dungeon Master's Guide, yet another of our 5e core books, but if you've already seen my other video on this, or rather on what I consider to be the true Dungeon Master's Guide, you know I'm not the biggest fan. Really everything in here belongs in here, but what I feel like it's missing is how the DM actually runs the game. So do check out this video about the actual Dungeon Master's Guide, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master by Sly Flourish. So let me know in the comments what books are on your keep pile. And thank you to all the Bob World Builder patrons who make this possible. Thank you to our sponsors, Valda's Spire of Secrets, and Describe, and keep building.